The topics discussed in this show may be triggering or harmful for some listeners. We tackle topics of suicide, self-harm, violence, child abuse, and death. Our hope is that even if you aren't able to listen to the whole story, that you can join us for the first 15 to 30 minutes where we catch up and gossip about our lives and the world. We will be intentional on marking where triggering information may be, as well as having timestamps in our episode descriptions for those topics. Thank you. Hello. Welcome back. Welcome back. To the Best Friends Guide to Money and Murder. Yes, that's Claire. I sure am. I'm Caroline. <laughs> I was realizing what you wanted me to do and I didn't do it. No, it's okay. We're both tired. We're both just hanging in there this week. Yeah, but I think most importantly, we want to thank everyone that's listened to episode one and two. We're recording this the day episode two came out. Mm-hmm. And people are liking it. I know. I'm, I haven't processed it yet fully, I don't think. It feels like I haven't, but I'm like really excited. I'm excited that like two people listen to it besides us. So I kind of processed it after like on the Sunday because like I've had a few people post on their story that I'm friends with. So sweet. And I've had a lot of people text me and say they love it. So um, yeah, it's been fun. And, you know, Mm -hmm. but it it, like sunk in. I was like, oh shit. Like it's not just us hanging out and talking. Mm -mm. People are listening. I know it's weird. It's weird, but fun. Welcome. Welcome. We're going to talk about weird stuff again today. Yeah. So I have a weird thing that happened. Or my mom did after listening to episode one. Okay. Tell me all about it. It was so fun. She was telling me that. And I was like, I'm going to tell Caroline about it on the podcast because I can okay. say that now. I say yay, that yay. like an annoying amount of time. As you should. Because I have a podcast now. Mm-hmm. We have a podcast now. It's okay. So. A shout out to your friend Stacy, who was shout out. listener number one, because my mom was mad she wasn't first. <laughs> and it's like I clicked post and then Stacy started listening. Dude, everybody was mad. My mom. I mean, my mom was fine. Uh, but Madeline was pissed. It was amazing. It's my favorite thing. Which we love anger and support bundled up in one ball. We do. We love competition for our affection. Yes. <laughs> So she was like, part, she was kind of listening throughout the day because she had a couple things she had to do. Mm-hmm. And she showed me this, um, on her iPhone, I guess I'm not a great iPhone user, so I don't, didn't know you could do this. She has okay. like a little like widget set up for photo memories. And on the day of the podcast released, it was Claire's birthday through the years. Oh. And after she started listening to it, it was the photo of you and me from my 21st birthday. Oh. But how the fuck did your her phone know it was you? I do not know. That's spooky. I don't like that. I don't either. But I love it at the same time. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that was just so eerie. It knew. It knew. I don't like that. <laughs> but that's really sweet. That was a fun birthday. I liked going. It was so fun. It's fun. Anything exciting? Oh, wait. I say anything exciting happened this week. We have a new president. Thank you, Jesus. Our Lord and Savior has provided. (laughs) Did you feel, okay, like we have to talk about it. We just have to. So I'm going to ask you some questions. I'm going to say what I feel and then you're going to say what you feel. So, okay, first of all, like the least important, but like the most important about like the dog, his dogs. There's going to be dogs in the White House again and they're really cute. So on the Saturday that Mm -hmm. it was um, announced that Biden had won Pennsylvania Mm -hmm. and that was 270 he was he was in Taylor showed me a news story that Major Biden is going to be the first rescue dog in the White House oh no and Mm -hmm. I shit you not I started bawling within three seconds of reading that story I hadn't cried all day throughout any of it and I figured I would but I read that story and I just started bawling. Oh, he's such a cute dog. Such a cute. I sent you a TikTok a little while ago. So don't watch it right now because you'll probably cry again. But it was about him being rescued by Biden. Aww. Aww. He's so cute. And so is Champ. Well, of course. We cannot forget Champ. Can we talk about the monochrome outfits? Just every, a lot of women were wearing purple, which is my favorite color. And I just, I just was so 
it was awesome. I don't think I sent you the screenshots. Okay. I work from home, so I was, had it on all day. Mm -hmm. Taylor was only able to have like the New York Times up and like sure. looking at it, not watching. And so we were texting and talking about it. And I sent him the picture of Michelle Obama. Mm -hmm. And I said, this is the only thing I ever want to talk about ever again. <laughs> and he keeps being like, you should buy the coat. And I was like, I get, that would be disrespectful for the coat. Disrespectful for the coat. I am not worthy of that. I mean, you are, but I'm biased as your best friend. So, so sorry. Well, like, oh, and Lady Gaga saying, oh my goodness. She was just a vision. Mm -hmm. And then Amanda Gorman. A chills. Just like it's speechless. Eric and I were watching it in the office together while we were working. And I took some pictures of when they both got sworn in. But God, she is one, beautiful and amazing. Two, she did not stutter. No. And three, she spoke. Oh, it was so like tranquil and elegant and powerful. Good for her. Good for her. She had the audacity. She had the audacity. And what a beautiful thing that the day that one of the most, like the worst people on this planet leaves, a beautiful black young adult woman gets to recite a poem that she wrote in front of all the haters did not stutter. She said that with her whole body. And it was so awesome. It was a day. It was like, a, it was an out of body experience. And me. here's why, because we were all afraid someone who was going to get shot. Yeah. Who was going to get shot? Is it our sweet baby bean, Amanda? We were worried for her. I got a little freaked out, but nobody did. No one Let did. me know. Yeah. I loved the Biden Bible. That thing. It was aggressive. Yes. Well, Bibles used like, were that big and there's some still are, but. It's like, it, I would love to see inside of it because I wonder if it's more like a study Bible. Hmm. I want to know how big the print is, if it's a study Bible and like what magical things are in there. Apparently he put, writes little notes in it, like dates he be sworn into office for different things. And that Bible's been in his family for like, like legit generations. And obviously like we both acknowledge that there's some shit to do. And obviously, like, you know, Biden's not perfect, but my brain, anything is better than what we were getting. It, it's the John Mulaney joke of, I love him. There's no longer a horse in the hospital. No longer a fucking horse in the hospital. We can and start figuring out right. why the horse got into the hospital. Exactly. And then we can focus on the people in the hospital. And then we can focus on never getting that horse back in the hospital again. Yes. We love impeachment. We love him being impeached, but still not being able to, like, still not leaving the office the first time. Anyway, and Biden seems moldable. Like, there's a lot of work to do to get him to do the things that he needs to do to make this country better. Yeah. And provide support to those who have been hurting for the past four years. But it was just, like, a nice day. Just to be like... The horse is out of the hospital. Super excited. Love that he ended with love you, see you soon and flew out while the y walked out while the YMCA was playing. He sure did treat that White House like the YMCA. So yeah, makes sense. But I'm excited. There's obviously again, a lot of work to do. He's made a lot of promises. So like to see that in action. Yeah. He did sign 17 executive orders. So we'd love to see it. We're back in the Paris Climate Accord. We're back in who? So many other very important ones. Still waiting for my stimmy check. <laughs> like the, the, the one he's promised. I'm part of the group that didn't get it. Does your dad report you on your taxes still? I'm about to do my taxes by myself for the first time. Will I become a white collar criminal that I have yes. to cover on this now? Because yes. I do my taxes wrong. Okay, let me know if you like need emotional support. I probably I will. Know. So oh, I have like a long story-ish. I'll make it. I'll try and speed her up. But what is, is your story depressing? Because mine is. Um, no. Okay, so I'll start then. I'm excited about my story today. It's a good one. Oh, okay. Um, mine is, it's, it's a story. Um, 
we'll get into it. So I today am doing the Kansas City Strangler. Oh, I haven't heard of I think I'm maybe, isn't it like an old timey guy? What do you mean by old timey? Like the, what, did this take place in like 1910s or was it recent? No, no, recent, more, more recent. <gasps> I didn't know this was a recent thing. <laughs> okay. Let me get into it. <laughs> it's just. I got too excited. It's kind of. So, no, I love it. Please get excited because it fuels my soul. So, this is the Kansas City Strangler. Um, sources, before we even start, because I'll forget later. Murderpedia, Wikipedia, place called mirror.co.uk, um, the Kansas City Star, and Lawrence Journal World. Ooh. Um, I like to cover Kansas stories. I think it's really interesting. So My dad has a couple Kansas based ones he has thought of. Mm. Okay. I might I might cover one of them though, because as you should. He knew the people involved. I'm good. You have yeah. to. Yeah. Okay. So just as a warning, we are telling a zinger of a story that includes murder, sexual assault, and other gruesome details. It's a little crazy. So, first of all, his name is Lorenzo Gilliard. For those who like zodiac signs, he's a Gemini. How do I know that? I don't. From what I've researched, though, this man has had a really violent upbringing and just a violent life. So he was born in May 24th, 1950 in Kansas City, Missouri. There's not a lot about like home life growing up. However, he, his dad was convicted of of assault with rape and sentenced to six months in 1970. Only six months? Are you surprised? I guess, no. Also, it was in 1970, so, but no, like, I'm not surprised by that. His sister, who her name was Patricia Dixon, born in 1958, was convicted of murder of a, she was a sex worker, and she was Convicted of a murder of like a customer in 1983 and sentenced to 10 years. Oh, so it, we're just running in the family. Mm-hmm. So she had stabbed a Johnson County guy 11 times in a dispute over $35. I would too. Honestly, me too. JK. She was also going to be charged with the death of another sex worker, but those charges were dropped. Fine. His brother, Daryl, and it sounds like his brother's friend, I'm not sure exactly all who, but was convicted of a drug-related murder in 1989. Okay. So, like we said, runs in the family. Unfortunately, runs in the family. So, don't know how life was growing up, but that those are all pretty um, heavy charges and convictions, so it makes me wonder what was going on in that home. He has only completed 10th grade. It has been said that in his younger years, he would bully others and be mean to women. And it's, I mean, like... <sighs> If you're not going to have a positive adult and you're going to have an adult in your life that is an extremely negative presence in the home, I mean, that can affect who you are when you grow up. Yeah. Again, not all the time. Obviously, kids are resilient. However, I'm not surprised, unfortunately. But, you know, this doesn't excuse his behavior. I've seen a lot of kids in my line of work go through a lot of terrible experiences, same thing that he's been going through, and they are some of the most kind and wonderful kids on the planet. But I think this is going to help us, and it's helped set up for what we learn later about what he's done. So his colleagues call him calm, even-tempered, respected by all guys. Of course. Interesting, right? Yeah. Just wanted to put that in there. Marrying at the first time of age 18, he has had 11 children with several wives and girlfriends. At least it's not the same woman, because that's a lot on one body. True. That's a lot of a lot of kids. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah, it is. So between like the 1970s and the 1980s, he becomes, he has a lot of charges. So at that point, he's, let's see, born 1950. Okay, so he's around like, in, he's in his 20s at this point. Okay. 1970, he would be 20. So 20 to 30 years old. Between the 1970s and the 1980s, he has charges ranging from military station and sexual abuse, burglary and assault. He also had like a weapons charge, disrupting the peace, lying to officers. This, but this usually just netted him some like short jail time and fines. But around the same time in 1970, that's when his father, Lorenzo Sr., was convicted of that 
assault. Um, in 1974, he's, he's arrested twice for rape. And in February of that same year, he is like accused of that with a 25 year old exotic dancer near Troost Avenue. Mm. Um, but for that one, prosecutors were never able to convict. July 1974, uh, he's charged with raping a, a friend's 13-year-old sister. Woof. He told police that she was lying. Are we surprised? No. No, we're not. Ultimately, he pled guilty and received a nine-month sentence in the Jackson County Jail. All right. Okay. 1979, he kidnaps a couple. Oh! Assaults the wife while holding... Or, sorry, assaults the girlfriend while holding the boyfriend hostage at gunpoint. The boyfriend was able to pick him out out of a police lineup. Oh. And the victim's hair is matched where that were found in the building where he was working. Like they like they matched. So, but they acquitted him. Why? Of the assault of the, of the lady in 1980. No. Because they don't like to give men sentences that are for rape and sexual assault. No. Because boohoo, I don't want to be on sex offender registry. Boo. I don't give a shit. Anyway. <sighs> a tangent. Um, so around 1981, in May, no, sorry, in January of 1981, he is convicted of aggravated assault for threatening to shoot his third wife. And she, she, she divorces him, though. She's Good. like, bye. I was going to say, you know, as you do, but not as you do. You don't. Oh, my God. <laughs> Well, the next month, he assaults his ex- ex-wife twice, beating her, pistol whipping her, breaking her front teeth, stabbing her in the arm, convicted of third degree assault, but he mainly served probation for these cases. Well, he was well respected by the guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Yeah. So in November of 1981, he earned his first sentence in a state prison. So there's jail and then there's prison. A little bit of a difference. So now he's in a state prison in Missouri where he was se- sentenced to four years for second degree bur- burglary. So, you know, you could like beat the shit out of your wife, but you rob from somebody and How it's 10 you. years, buddy. Four years, sorry. Four years, buddy. And you better think about what you did. And you better slap on the wrist, honey. Yeah. How dare you take someone's things. Right. As the timeline goes, um, in... And around May 17th of 1982, he begins serving a sentence on that date. I think that's when he's serving the sentence for the burglary. That makes sense. Um, This is eight days after the body of one of his victims was found. And this is the start of where they believe he may have been the killer. And I'm going to go into the victims in a little bit. 1983, on January 10th, he's released on parole, but returned to prison after violating the terms of his release. You really gotta, you you gotta follow them rules, dude. He didn't think hard enough about what he did. No, he sure didn't. That slap on the wrist wasn't, wasn't enough, unfortunately. On his return, he starts, um, settling down back into, like, a normal quote-unquote life. He works for a company that employed his father, um, in its maintenance department, so he works for Death and Bod Disposal Service. And so that's around like 1986. So he works his way up um, the back of a trash truck and up to a driver. And then he was promoted to supervisor. So this, the company spokesperson said that he was a real, really reliable employee. So this is, I think this was the same guy who said that he was just one of the guys, one of the, one of the dudes. He had respect for his peers and was even tempered and friendly. He would bring gifts to people really like it was their birthday so he brought people gifts mm-hmm. <laughs> i mean like i do that sometimes but i also don't fucking hurt people so anyway yeah all right so in 1968 he meets well he marries rena hill after she became pregnant they divorced a couple of five years later after what hill described as five years of torture she's been known to say he destroyed my life now it's crept back up it's horrible she she had remarried and tried to put her life with Gilliard behind her. Um, they had met in high school and attended dances together. Oh. Um, he used to be really fun, but that changed when he they got married. They yeah, so he was fun, but 
that changed when they got married, which is not surprising. People who are domestic like violence abusers, perpetrators, this is their MO. This is very much so there are different categories of abusers. I'd have to find my like little cheat sheet on that. But this is, I mean, the makeup of someone who is a domestic violence perpetrator. So I'm not surprised. Yeah. Which <sighs> wife was this? One or two or three? I'm not sure. Okay. How many wives did you say he had? He, he has 11 children, but um, many wives and girlfriends. So I'm not sure. Oh, okay. He got around. He got around. He was like awful to her, like the worst, the worst. Threatened me, said he'd kill her, mm. things like that. He would buy her things. Of course. Oh, he, oh, no, no, no. So sorry. He would, he loves nice things, pretty things, but you can't use them. He made me live in one room, the bedroom, for five years. I hate that. I hate that. So let's go into, so now we got a little bit of a background on. Lorenzo mm-hmm. and some of his early crimes. Let's go to the meat and the bones, which is why he's why he's in jail now forever. Most, if not all, of his victim, most of his victims, sorry, not all of them, were sex workers. Mm-hmm. They were found shoeless and dumped in secluded spots around Kansas City. Mm-hmm. Most had cloth or paper towels stuffed into their mouths and ligature marks around their necks kind of figured we were heading there with the whole we were really heading there so sorry the strangler part of this all um so that's really sad you know if you have a a mode of how you're gonna do it people are gonna figure it out yeah so in 1987 he becomes a suspect in one of these murders for Sheila Ingold. What's cool is a crime lab later linked all of his victims, and there's 13 of them. Oh, wow. To one killer using a DNA sample testing from this investigation of Sheila. Snaps for everyone <laughs> involved there. <laughs> oh, it's so cool when people do that. I freaking love, like, this is a tangent, but, like, forensic science and stuff like that. Oh, it was my favorite. Forensic files? Hello. Hi. How are you? That stuff's so cool and, like, fascinating to me. I mean, I I just love, I think it's just so awesome. So all of, so they all had things in common. Like I said, they were, they were found dead during the same, a year and a half period, all secluded, all strangled, all showed signs that they were involved in a struggle, all were missing the shoes, and all but one showed distinct signs of assault. And you said this was all in a year and a half time frame? Mm-hmm. If we thought Eileen was busy the last episode. We sure did, but uh, he he went more on a rampage than our, our old sweet bean. So I'm going to go through the names of the victims. Yeah. And then I think that's going to be the easiest way to do this, just because there's so many. And yeah. it's just like also important to say their names. So we'll go into the trial a little bit, but he, he didn't end up being convicted for these murders. So Catherine Barry was 34. She was not a prostitute, was not a sex worker. And she was found on March 14th, 1986. They think like her family says that she was um, going through a lot of mental health stuff. Mm. And would often walk this sh- around the streets and accept rides from strangers, so they could, sh- so that she could share her religious faith with them. Oh, a lot of her sisters and fam and daughter and like her children spoke out about her and were just like she. They basically said like she was the sweetest, oh. and just they. I mean, they, obviously they were really upset, but they she would just, just like like to talk about Jesus. Yeah, loved the colored turquoise and. Like how she would help care for her sister, Trisha, and how like her daughter, Don, who was 16 when this happened, like felt like once he was charged with this murder, like her mom was finally vindicated. Good. She said, I just want to go on top of a mountain somewhere and yell, which is a mood, which you sh- I hope she did. Me Honestly, too. she deserves it. He was, okay. So then he was also charged for the murders of Naomi Kelly, who was 23, 
Ann Barnes, who was 36, Kelly Ford, who was 20, um, and Sheila Ingold, who was 36. Mm. Other victims that were brought to trial, but they couldn't, I don't know if they could Convict. charge him for it. Yeah. Was Stacy Swafford, who was, I think, I think 17. Mm. And then Gwendolyn um, Kinzine, which was 15. Oh, geez. Gwendolyn was found on January 23rd, 1980, behind a building. She had only been missing for like a day. Oh, geez. Her brother, Bill, says like, my family, my whole family, like they've suffered and they just couldn't understand why they don't get to hear her like be tried, like and be tried for her murder. Yeah. Other ones that um, Margaret Miller, Debbie Blevins, Helga Kruger, and Connie Luther. Authorities were also trying to determine if there was a link between Gilliard and another woman, Paula Davis, who was 21 and disappeared in 1987. As a fun fact, we need a fun fact. We here. do need a fun fact. Pierce Morgan did an interview with this guy. <laughs> <laughs> I woke up today and I knew Whoa. it was going to be chaotic because I checked Twitter and Pierce Morgan was trending. Are you serious? Yeah, because apparently he said some like stuff about Racist Larry. Racist shit. Stuff about like Larry King. I'm actually pulling this up because I want to see. He's not trending on mine. Oh, he's Damn on the it. For You page trending. Some people are criticizing Pierce Morgan over his remarks on the death of Larry King. Hmm. La- Ooh. Pierce Morgan tweeted, Larry King was a hero of mine until we fell out after I replaced him at CNN. And he said, my show was like watching your mother-in-law go over a cliff in your new Bentley. Parentheses. He married eight times. So a mother-in-law expert in parentheses. But he was a brilliant broadcaster and masterful TV interviewer. Okay, here's the deal. Our opinions are our own. So like, don't freaking sue us. I do not like Piers Morgan. I am not impressed with him as a person. He has said very, very harmful things and done, it sounds like, a couple harmful things. And it's okay to, like, not have a filter. Like, I get it. But, like, read the room, right? Read the room. So, first of all, he sucks. Yeah. Second of all, he had a show called Serial Killer. I did not know this. It's on Netflix. Um, and he interviewed Lorenzo and they interviewed him at the jail, like the Missouri. I think he wow. was in Missouri. So I took notes on this interview because it was very interesting. Yeah. Now it was very interesting. And I'm a person who reads body language, especially when watching stuff about serial killers. And what's interesting is the way his body language is the entire interview. He sits back in his chair. His arms are crossed. He's not showing a lot of emotion on his face. Lorenzo isn't. Yeah. I think Pierce is like trying to match his body language a little bit, but like there's that ego complex there. So like he's not going to. Of course not. Just to kind of give you the rundown. When asked by Pierce about like, how do you feel about all of this? He's like, I feel bad, but there's, there ain't anything I could do about it. Later saying, I'm sorry to what happened to them. That's all I can say. I didn't do it, but I'm sorry. That's icky. I don't feel good about having the words grace my ears no and he said like he asked lorenzo lorenzo what his defense was like just do you remember like in court like what your defense was and he kept saying i don't know and that's going to be that's like a theme did lorenzo represent himself at his trial no no no, no, no. oh that would check out but i don't think so so okay. let's go with how was he caught so he was lorenzo was picked up at a diner Okay. And he was shown pictures of all of the women and asked two questions. Do you know her? Oh, three questions. Sorry. Do you know her? Have you had any physical contact with her? Have you ever seen her? Okay. He would always say no and not to my knowledge. And like they play some of that interview with the police and it's just that same tonality over and over again. He would say, no, no, I don't know her. No, not to my knowledge. Just like that. This is a complete sidebar, but very important to me. What do you think he had at the diner to eat? Like, what what would be his breakfast order there? He for sure ate a milkshake at, like, 9 in the morning. 
Yeah, and like a hamburger at nine in the morning. Oh, yeah, but God, I'm, I'm hungry. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so um, one of his victims, Connie Luther, like one of the ones he was last accused of was Connie Luther. Um, and she had like a string around her neck. Pierce had talked to a woman during the interview or during the interview who what who had been a, a sex worker during that time. And she was like, yeah, you would always just like worry about your friends. Mm-hmm. And it was like a terror time, terrifying time for everyone. As we know, Lorenzo's sister was a pros- uh, was a sex worker. And when Pierce asks him, okay, so like, what do you think the impact of your sister being a prostitute did for you? And he was like, oh, it had no impact. That doesn't check out, buddy. He said it did make him sad. He said yes to didn't make you sad. And then um, Pierce asked him if he has any opinion on prostitutes. His quote, unquote, that's his term. And it, Lorenzo was like, no, I don't have any opinion. I don't know how to answer that. He said, then it was, have you ever ha- like been with, been with a prostitute? And the rest said, I don't know. Okay. But then if given the chance, he said, yes. But then he said, I don't know. Okay. But then he said, you pay for sex when you take a woman out for a drink or out to dinner. At that point, you don't call them prostitutes. You call them your girlfriend. Later, when you take a girl out for dinner, in hopes of what for sex and he also said if it doesn't end up in sex you're gay so you know (laughs) and like pierce is like wait what (laughs) he's like wait a minute you just said let's go back to that you just said that if you if you take a girl out and pay for all this stuff then you expect to have sex there he's like no that's not what i said Buddy, that's what you said. And Pierce is like, what? It was just like, Pierce is just trying to get an answer out of him. And he's like, no, that's not what I meant. And he would say that he said all those things. So obviously he doesn't have a good um, perception of women. Not that we couldn't tell that already because he fucking murdered 13 people. But then he thinks that, you know, if you don't have sex with someone after going out to dinner, then you're gay. So that's cool. That's a lot to process. Mm-hmm. 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 Um, asked about he kept Pierce around kept like talking about it. he's like I didn't kill those people he's like I didn't kill these women if I had sex with those women I would have paid them would you but then also it's like okay so did you or did you not yeah make up your mind buddy make up your mind so then Pierce like also asks about assault charges that he has like in 1960 nine he's like his girlfriend and he said that's how it started he's like i lived in the hood i told police like that girl was lying he brought up the 1980 charge where he like threatened to shoot his wife and he said oh she lied and starts laughing no so that was funny like that was really funny it took like a decade basically for him to be like convicted and stuff like that so in 2003 like 10 years after it happened, DNA analysis was able to be performed. His DNA had been saved from Sheila's case. Now he says, according to the interview, that Kansas City police framed him and tampered with the DNA. It's always a setup. Right. And that he doesn't know why they would frame him. And then he states that he's never been tested. Like his DNA has never been tested. He's never gotten his blood taken. Um, But that was found to be incorrect information. And then he said, that it was destroyed at some point. Okay. Um, so when he was arrested for the 13 more murders, his DNA was never taken again. And then it goes from, in that interview, it goes from him saying that to one of the forensic analysts talking about it. And she was like, oh no, they did do a, have a 2004 sample, according to the analysis. Um, also items from his possessions, like they took DNA from his like stuff that they had gotten from him. Um, and it matched all the other DNA samples. Um, 12, 12 um, of the victims had semen on them. That's one big old quinky dink. And my favorite fact, fun fact, is that it is a one in 18th quadrillionth chance it could be anyone but Lorenzo. And so Piers Morgan says this, and, and I think this is where I have to go back, but basically Lorenzo walks out of the interview. He's like, okay, I'm done. He said, I didn't do it, but I'm sorry. And they just like stare at each other. 
because Piers Morgan was like, okay, like there's this like one in 18, like million gazillion chance that it could be anyone but you. So like, I'm not really understanding like why you can't admit that you did this. He said, like, I find what you say about women pretty disturbing and surprising. He didn't know his defense in court. He was like, I was just there. I was just, I don't know. I don't remember. A fun, like, Thursday afternoon activity. Just like a fun, yeah, 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 yeah. He's got stuff to do later, but he's going to hop into his trial. Yeah. Pierce was like, so do you think I'm, like, an idiot? (laughs) And that's when he walks out. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Um, Because he doesn't want to, like, he continues to say, I don't know. I wasn't there. And you can see him get angry, but it's interesting because obviously this person is a manipulative person and a piece of crap Mm -hmm. um, and has like spent years manipulating people and hurting them. So it's interesting to see him because I feel like he's getting fake mad. Interesting. He knows he did it. And we know that he knows that he did it, Mm -hmm. but it's that pride. So some serial killers are proud of what they do. Some like to have the control of never letting people know that he was the, that they were the, actually the ones that did it. Mm -hmm. It gives them that final control over their victims, which I think is what's happening in this case. I think, I think he's going to go to his, his grave saying that he doesn't know him. Didn't do it. Wasn't there. Wasn't there. I, he's just here. So he doesn't get fined. So he was sentenced after being convicted of six counts of murder on March 16th, 2007, he was sentenced to life in prison without parole and is serving that life sentence in Western Missouri Correctional Center. Here's a fun fact, two fun facts. He has killed more women than Jack the Ripper and he doesn't like being called a serial killer. Why not? Does it hurt his feelings? It hurts his widow feelings. Uh-huh. He says, don't call me that. I don't like being called that. And Pierce is like, well, like you killed a bunch of women. <laughs> he didn't do it. So he's like, I didn't do it. I don't like that word. He's like, so a word that I am saying to you is making you uncomfortable. And you don't want to call me that. He's like, yeah, that's disrespectful. You need to watch the interview. It's pretty amazing. Like, again, I like do not like Pierce Morgan. He sucks, has no chin, doesn't make any sense. However, like he asks some good questions. He could read the room a little bit, but also he's in front of like a convicted serial killer so like i get it right i just imagine the poor like camera crew that's with them both for this when i worked for the sports network in town we had to worry about like if fights broke out and like just observing them nice and like that was a lot just on like high school sports level so like being in a room with a serial killer but he's not that so we won't call him that and just having to film him. Oh, yeah. Like, he st- he walked off and he took the off the lav mic, put it down by the door that he was leaving in, and walked the fuck out. Alrighty. He was more respectful of the camera crew's mic than he was of any of these women. Um, So, to end on, like, a quote, not from this mean person, um, but the judge who sentenced him, Judge John O'Malley, said, he's forfeited any right to live here among the rest of us. That's the comfort we can derive. And that's the story of good old Lorenzo. That's what, I didn't know about that story. That was a good one. Mm-hmm. Do you know why they didn't try and do the death penalty? I'm not sure. Um, it's a great question if we just think of it man, man v. woman. Eileen got sentenced to death. I mean, it was a different state, but she got sentenced to death. Yeah. Did he just his life in prison? But again, like I... We hate the death penalty. Just surprised that he wasn't, that wasn't a thing for him. He's serving six life sentences. So good. I think that might, I think that's worse. Yeah. Honestly, good. Good. Keep them there. Love it. So today, sweet friend, mm-hmm. I am telling you the story of the theft of the painting, A Cavalier. Oh. <gasps> Art thief. Art thief. <gasps> Fun! Okay, I'm ready. Fun. My whole body is ready. So this is the painting. I I recognize the painting. Oh, I didn't. But, so I'm glad you do. Which we'll put it in our Instagram post for people to see. Or you could Google it. It's a beautiful painting. A Cavalier was painted by Dutch master Frans van Meers 
Franz worked during the golden age of Holland painting. He did a lot of genre paintings and portrait work for wealthy clients. And he was also known for his ability to paint satin skirts and fabrics. Oh, fun. Yeah, that was one of his like specialties. Both of his sons and his grandson were accomplished painters. Mm -hmm. They were called the Leiden family painters. Cute. I know, right? Leiden is a small town in Holland. Okay. And Franz was born there, died there, vibed out there his whole life. Love it. Me too. He was painting at the same time as Vermeer and Rembrandt. Ooh. Yeah. So he, Franz worked in very small canvases, and that'll be key to this story. Uh, He would typically work on canvases that were 12 to 15 inches. So pretty small. And if a painting that was bigger than that, those kind of dimensions Mm -hmm. attributed to him, it was likely one of his son's work or it was an Mm. imposter. This would result in viewers standing very close to his work, creating a sense of intimacy. Mm. A Cavalier is kind of a prime example of Franz's work. Mm -hmm. Again, it was painted on a small canvas. Apparently, Mm -hmm. it's a self-portrait. Really? Yeah. (gasps) Fun. Fun. (laughs) My self-portrait for like stick people. Wow, when you see someone living the life you want. Sorry, okay, keep going. The clothing was elegant, but not excessive. Mm -hmm. His work would sell at auction for between $3,000 and $3 million. Mm -hmm. His most expensive work sold for $5 million, and that painting was titled A Young Woman in a Red Jacket Feeding a Parrot, which, what a title. What? Okay, keep going. Philanthropist James Fairfax owned the painting. In 1993, he donated the painting to the New South Wales Art Gallery in Sydney, Australia. Okay. It's one of the largest art galleries in Australia. So it was a busy Sunday morning, mm-hmm. specifically June 10th, 2007. There were about 6,000 people in the museum that mm-hmm. day. And between 10 a.m. and 12.30 p.m., the painting was stolen from the museum. Uh Uh-oh. Who was getting fired? (laughs) Oh, no. Oh, no. So here's the thing, though. There were no alarms or motion detectors, so that meant that any of the 6,000 people in the museum that day could have just walked out of the museum with that painting. And it was small. It was small. So a girl with a big bag... Slap her in there. Slap her in there. Oh, no. The art gallery director said, was quoted saying, to be honest, you could just slip it under your coat and it could have happened that way. So here's where we get back to someone's getting fired. Uh, Mm -hmm. No one realized the painting had been stolen for two days. Good. Good, 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 good. Tight, 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 tight. Hey, is it it a big museum? Am I dumb? Yeah, it's the, one of the largest in Sydney. Okay, well, that makes sense. Well, there you go. There you go. Okay, well, that makes a little more sense. I kind of get it. I kind of get it. But still. <laughs> but still. So after they conducted an internal investigation, they realized that the painting was not still in the building, and that's when they contacted the police. Mm. Customs wasn't notified until three days after the theft. <laughs> So in 2007, an FBI expert said if the thief was not found soon, the painting would be gone for years. Oh. Which is, that's the year the painting was stolen. Mm-hmm. And one source I read, they said that all it would have taken was a Phillips head screwdriver removing two $2.45 wall hangers in 60 <laughs> seconds. Like, that's it, to get it off the wall. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Oh, no. Which, isn't that crazy to think about, like, all of these, like, valuable pieces of art? On some command strips. Command strips, basically. (laughs) All right. Well, that's, like, a choice. We, obviously, the wrong choice. We're finding this out. Uh Uh-huh. They did believe it was an inside job because the security screws were removed without setting off alarms or damaging the canvas. Is this Nicolas Cage? (laughs) Surprise, it's just national treasure. That's what it sounds like. Okay, sorry. And they're pretty sure that it was not a spur-of-the-moment decision. 
Okay. The frame was secured in both the top left and right spots by a keyhole hangers, and they were visible but painted the same color as the wall, mm-hmm. and the screws could be accessed by the public. Okay. There were no closed circuit television cameras on the ground room floor, so no, no security cameras. Okay. And the security guards were patrolling elsewhere, so they just had people on foot. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and it mm-hmm. would have just taken a minute to unscrew the small painting. The gallery director, whose his name is Edmund Capone. Okay. He Edmund has a lot of quotes that I have coming up. I'm ready. I love quotes. So the gallery was actually told by the New South Wales government that they had inadequate security before the painting was stolen. So it kind of goes back to your point. A little too late. They learned the lesson the hard way. Really, really. So, quote, we were very conscious of the fact that they were understaffed and had no technology in terms of security. And yet we had all of these priceless paintings. Edmund told the Sun Herald in 2010, the situation has been rectified, but it should have been rectified without having to pay that price. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are no witnesses, no DNA, no fingerprints, and even no screws left. They took the screws. They took the screws. So Robert Goldman, an agent with the FBI art crime team, said, quote, our experience in the FBI, our experience, the FBI's experience, is that approximately 80% of the museum theft cases of art are inside jobs, either people who work there or people who say they have keys to the kingdom, basically. According to the Art Lost Registry, only 12 to 15% of stolen art is ever recovered. The estimated value of the artwork stolen worldwide is $1.6 billion US yearly. So yearly, over a billion dollars worth of artwork is stolen, which is crazy. Why? Just why? (laughs) Uh, Fun fact, compared to bank robberies, art theft is done because it's a lot less likely that you will be detected and art galleries typically have lower levels of security. That makes sense. After weeks of investigating and reviewing the tapes, police were not able to come up with any leads. Edmund said that my instinct is that I'm not likely to see it again. I don't know why. I can't explain it. I just have that feeling, which is sad. Hmm. You know, you're the gallery director and he's like, I don't Mm -hmm. think I'm ever going to see it again. That was really sad. He also said, the quote I said earlier, that you could just slip it under your coat. Yeah. Yeah. Another theory was that the thieves took it thinking they could just sell it, but that's kind of been debunked. Okay. Because the guess is the audience for a piece like this is pretty small. Like, it's not a crazy well-known piece. Yeah, that makes sense. And anyone that knew kind of the value of the piece would have known it was stolen. So when they say it's an inside job, did anyone, like, stop working there, like, after the painting was stolen? Do we know? Not that I could read. They also thought it could be stolen for a particular investor who didn't care if it was stolen. Mm -hmm. But New York scholar and art dealer Otto Nauman, I believe is how you say it. (laughs) Yeah. He said there are no documented cases of wealthy individuals commissioning art theft. Quote. It's not, it's not human psyche to have something that important and not tell anyone, he says. We make it up because it sounds like a nice story, which it does. It does. Just in general, it's difficult to sell things, mm-hmm. sell well-known art, but it could be used in a drug deal as security or sold as a copy for a fraction of the value. Okay. Which is crazy to think about. Like, you buy a copy of a piece of art and it's the original. A UK art blogger who is a reformed jewel and art thief, Mm -hmm. which, good for them. Good for them. Yeah. They noted that it would probably be at max on the black market worth $20,000, but it also, yeah, but it also could only be worth a few thousand if the theft wanted to make a deal and get, quote, a few snorts of coke. If you sell it for, like, a few thousand dollars, does that only buy you a few snorts of Coke? That was my big question. You know, I don't know. 
because I've never done drugs. Me either. And the thought of looking that up. But also I just kind of want to Google how much does cocaine cost. You literally let's look well, you look it up. Yeah. I'm not even going for a private tab. Yeah. <laughs> that's a power move. <laughs> the first thing that's coming up uh is in the autofill is how much does cool sculpting cost? Oh. 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 How much do drugs cost? Shut up. You got it. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. Oh, here's cocaine. Here's that's what I skipped over it. Oh, the price of cocaine has increased drastically. Oh. But purity has decreased. That makes sense. Unfortunately. I guess it averages out to be about 112 grams or per gram. Okay. Typically, a gram of cocaine can be broken down to into 10 lines or about 25, quote, bumps or, quote, hits. They have air quotes around this, which is making me laugh. Hardcore users usually use up to five grams per day. Mm-hmm. So that would be like 50 lines. Mm-hmm. And people do whatever they can to get when they're really in their full addiction. People do whatever they can to get the money to be able to do that. So it's sad. Well, thank you to the Addiction Center for sponsoring this tangent. They're not actually sponsoring us, <laughs> but they did give us very useful information. Mm-hmm. Okay. So it was not likely a crime of opportunity. Uh, because of the tools needed for the crime, like you, like I said, a, a screwdriver, you got to bring mm-hmm. it in your mm-hmm. big bag. Mm-hmm. Also, if it was a crime of opportunity, it would be hard to dispose or return it, the painting. Okay. Why would you do that? But okay. Maybe you took it in like a panic. Maybe you thought you had the frame. <gasps> Maybe you took it in a panic. Honestly, you're right. Thought it would look nice in your kitchen, and then the wall was too small to hang it up. So you You're bring right. it back. You're so... Bring it up to guest services. Sorry, homie. Don't have a receipt. Maybe they thought it was, you know, a Hobby Lobby. Yeah. And maybe they've never been to Hobby Lobby before. They took the wrong directions. They said, this seems right. And then... Didn't pay for it. Didn't pay for it. Because I got too stressed and ran away. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Checks out. Checks out. Um, so the museum was particularly embarrassed by this because they had just revealed a massive new security operation that was going to be underway because they had an Islamic art installation opening just eight days later. And the gallery wouldn't reveal the worth of the painting, but it was estimated to be worth over $1 million, which makes sense because I, I can't remember if I put it in. But I think it was the reformed jewel thief said that on the black market, you only get like 20% of the worth. So if they revealed the true net worth, yeah, it could increase its street value. The acting sergeant said police suspended their investigation in 2008 after exhausting all avenues of investigation. Police cannot speculate on why the artwork was stolen other than to speculate the artwork may have been sold to a black market investor. However, no evidence exists to substantiate this, um, the acting sergeant said to the Herald Sun, the Sun Herald, sorry. Quote, it is believed the artwork may have been smuggled outside of the country. Mm-hmm. It is believed that it was smuggled out of the country the same day it was stolen. Mm-hmm probably to London or Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Here's my note I was saying just a second ago. Uh, In those cities, it is typical that dealers will at max pay 10% of the legal value. Good old Otto from before the art dealer and scholar said there's a 50-50 chance that the painting was destroyed. Mm -hmm. However, he says that he believes the painting still exists and eventually someone somewhere will need to get assess the painting's authenticity. It's on the FBI's top unsolved art crimes ever. Wow. This is said to be Australia's biggest art thief. And I read in a story that was published saying four months later, there are still no answers. But now it's been 13, nearly 14 years later, there are still no answers. 
and that is the theft of a cavalier. It's so sad. It's so sad. I mean, she's a cute painting, but like that's so sad. Especially with the fact that like there's it could have been destroyed. That's just like that's like the worst. And that's when you have to just make up a story, like a different one of like, oh, it's probably someone probably has it in their house. Some rich person wanted it and paid someone to go get it. Right. I think so. Like it's sad that the museum had to pay that price to be like, okay, maybe we shouldn't, I don't know, just use two screws and a command strip to hang it up mm-hmm. and call it a day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, it's like hard, like thinking, like, how do you, like, you have so much art, like you can't have like a glass box for all of it. Yeah. There's these funny pictures. I couldn't get them like downloaded high enough quality for it to be worth it. Mm-hmm. But I, I'm guessing it's the director holding up what would like a replica size of what it would be mm-hmm. it's so fucking it's tiny. Little it's smush. a little smush it's a little smush you said what was 12 by what 12 by 16 uh he typically only worked in canvases that were up to 15 inches so like this big like that big a little pencil case yeah oh yeah shit you could just like honestly if you had a big sweatshirt it's going in the sweatshirt yeah like i said a tote bag Get it from the museum gift shop, walk in, grab your art. This, and... this is national treasure. It is. Amazing. Well, good job. That's sad, though. Hmm. Anything else for the good of the order, my friend? If you want to find us, I made us a link tree, so that way you don't have to hear us rattle off everything. So that is, um, if you just search link tree slash bf guide to mm but the link tree part is l-i-n-k-t-r period e-e and then slash and then we have our our website is live you can Mm -hmm. find that there and it's linked in the description and you can email us caroline do you remember what our email is um our email is bf guide to money and murder at gmail.com so you can send us an email. Yeah. I am an email person, so I will check it. But yeah, thank you guys for supporting us for the first um, two. We're excited to kind of see, again, where this goes um, from here. So yeah, be good, everybody. Be and safe. Wear your mask. Wear your mask. Wear your mask.